Cool, thanks Emma. Um, recording in progress. Um, okay, uh, apologies in advance, because there is a ton to get through, but as Emma said, um, not just because of the like political context that's coming up, but it is super important that as a tenants movement, we are uh, like fully across the detail of what's what's going going on. And, and there's a couple examples over the last like over the last year and before that that to me have made that really clear. So the first was when the government introduced the eviction ban, the right at the start of the pandemic, and it was absolutely nothing of the sort. And if it wasn't for our organization, Living Rent Members, being super across the detail of that. That's what all that would have been in place, and, and thousands and thousands of people would have been evicted over the course of the pandemic. Even even other homelessness organisations that you'd think would have been across it were like congratulating them when they first brought that out. But it was only because we were fully on across the details, and um, that we were able to stop that. And similarly, as we'll touch on in, in my presentation about rent pressure zones, the the government tried to do something that on paper sounds nice, but the details of it just totally didn't work. And and if it wasn't for us being across that, we'd never be able to to fight back um, and so this what I'm about to share uh, my, the presentation on rent controls just to be clear I'm not trying to persuade anyone that rent controls are a good idea I assume if we're, we're all here we probably already think rents are too high and they should come down and um, what I'm trying to persuade you of as I say is not that they're a good idea but that they're they have the potential to be super transformative and to kind of equip you with the, the arguments that you're going to need to, to win those arguments with um, uh, whoever on the street, on doorsteps, and um, with politicians. Um, and apologies in advance. I, I thought it'd be funny to have the most like corporate um, template for this that I could find, but but maybe that's not funny. But so just to dive right in. Um, so the case for rent controls. Um, as I say, most people are probably already kind of intuitively supportive of it. But I think there's some details in it that are worth wondering about. Um, so the first, obviously, is, is cost, right? So over the last kind of 10 years, rents across Scotland have been absolutely spiralling. So the stat here is that in the, la in the seven years up to 2017, average rents in the Lothians increased by 33.7%. In Glasgow, it was, I think, 32%, very similarly. Um, and actually, over the course of the pandemic, that hasn't got any better. So I pulled out a stat today that uh, the average price for a four-bed flat in Glasgow, the average rent, um, over the last 12 months, right, so over the course of the pandemic has increased by more than 25%. Um, so the, the prices, the costs speak for themselves, and the impact of that is also self-explanatory, right? So the, the number of private tenants, or the number of people living in the private rented sector who are classed as living in poverty has increased by 75%. And the other impact of high costs in the private rented sector is that it traps people there, right? You're paying so much in your monthly rent that you've got no money to put aside to save for a deposit, uh, and so you, you have no hope of ever getting out of the private rented sector. There was a study not long ago that showed that fully 50% of private tenants have just given up altogether on the, on the prospect of ever owning their own home, um, which is a, a shocking statistic. Um, but it's not just cost, right? So the, the quality of rented homes in Scotland are atrocious. So every second home, more than 50%, fail the government's own standards on quality. Uh, and I think sometimes when you talk about this, there's a tendency for people to be like, that's a bit inconvenient or it's not, it's not super nice. But, but the reality is that the sort of disrepair that we're talking about is really consequential, right? It's not just a, it's not just a, an inconvenience. It has a huge impact on people's health. There was a report not long ago that suggested, I think just before the pandemic, it will only have gotten worse, that suggested that poor quality housing costs the NHS billions of pounds. And that's to put a figure on it, but obviously the, the, that takes a big impact on, on people's health. And increasingly we're seeing evidence around the impact it has on people's mental health. Um, and private rented homes are the worst insulated, which of course means less comfortable places to live, colder, damper, um, and, and issues around mould. It also means uh, much higher energy bills, exacerbating fuel poverty and issues around that. And the environmental impact of poor quality housing is also enormous. With COP on the horizon, that's an angle that I think is going to be important to, to drill home. I'll power through a couple of the other ones. Um, so the private rented sector, will come back to this point, but the private rented sector has exploded in scale. It's more than tripled since the 90s. And I think there was a, there used to be a perspective, and, and it still lingers in some policymakers, that it's just like, it's just students who rent. And that is just absolutely not the case at all. And people are renting well into their 30s and beyond, seeing people raising kids, having families in the private rented sector, and even retiring into the PRS, not to, not to even mention the amount of 
private rented homes and the qualities, the quality issues associated with that, that are being used as emergency accommodation in place of, of better, more secure stuff. We'll come back to this point. Um, uh, a couple of the other impacts of this. So private rented housing is not uh, evenly distributed, right? Tenants in private rented housing aren't evenly distributed across society. So the vast majority of tenants are, are much younger. So between 16 and 34, it makes up 40% of the PRS. Um, private tenants are way more likely to be migrants. Uh, and um, and although women aren't disproportionately represented in private rented housing, the fact that there's a gender pay gap, for example, of about 10% in Scotland means that rents that are unaffordable for everyone are even more unaffordable for women. Um, and, and those high housing costs have been identified as a, as a key factor that trap people in abusive relationships, um, as well as a gender pay gap. There's, of course, a, a, a racial and ethnic pay gap in Scotland. Um, and for example, on LGBT, uh, you know, young LGBT people who are estranged from their, their families, often social housing is not an option. And, and so what you find is that housing acts as this like exacerbating factor for almost every other social inequality that exists, from wealth to gender to race to um, to around homophobia, and absolutely everything is, is made worse in by by the private rented sector. And um, the wealth inequality one us was speaks for itself. But there, there's a point here that's really important, right? Which is that almost everywhere in Scotland, I think there's one local area where it's not the case. Average monthly mortgage payments are significantly, in some cases, by more than fifty percent less than average monthly rent payments. And so what that means is if you have two people, right, and they both move into a home on the same day, and they both live there for 20 years, and they both leave at the end of it, right, one of them will have paid more every month for that period, and then at the end of it, they'll have nothing to show for it, and the other person will have paid less every month, and at the end of it, they'll have an asset worth hundreds of thousands of pounds to show for it, and the only difference is that the second person, the person who bought, was wealthier to begin with. So that adage about the rich get richer and the poor get poorer is almost in no circumstance more true than it is in the private rented sector. Uh, and then just the last one, and this, this is an important one, is rent controls are one of the most popular things that get, that get floated. Poll after poll after poll shows enormous and growing public support for it. We commissioned a poll last year that showed 75% of people in Scotland support it. That rises to 85% when you ask SNP voters. Um, and that support cuts across parties. There's a plurality even of Tories, of Tory voters who support rent controls, and, and even homeowners support rent controls. It's one of the most popular policies a party could possibly propose. And there's all sorts of other benefits as well. So lots of the other interventions we need to make in housing cost a lot of money, but rent controls would save literally billions. So the PRS across the UK costs up to 23 billion pounds a year, every year, in housing benefit and, and the housing aspect of universal credit alone. And that's not to mention the billions more that get wasted on tax breaks and subsidies, both for higher rents and to keep house prices high generally, and the untold billions that get wasted in, in um, healthcare costs. And the, you know, I don't like to talk about homelessness in terms of the financial costs, because obviously the kind of social aspect of it is, is, is the most important, but that does also cost untold billions. So the cost of um, putting someone through emergency accommodation for a year can be upwards of £10,000 for one person for one year, um, whereas you could get them a flat for, for a couple of pounds, just a, you know, a fraction of that cost. So, so as I say, rent controls are urgently needed for a whole range of issues, um, and they're super popular. So why haven't the Scottish government done it? Well, just briefly, it's worth understanding how we got here in the first place. So um, in 1915, in Glasgow, when the First World War was starting, there was a, landlords were massively increasing rents because they thought the men were away and the women wouldn't fight. Um, and so in some cases, rents were tripled overnight. And there was this big wave of rent strikes that began in Glasgow, spread across Scotland and then across the UK that forced our right wing, you know, it wasn't like a progressive government at the time, forced them to introduce rent controls and begin a process of social housing, uh, of, of building social housing in, in earnest. And for the next kind of 70 years, you had the private rented sector gradually basically being, I mean, literally being demolished um, and replaced with much better, much more high quality social housing. Um, and that all started to change in the 80s. So the, in the 80s, you saw wages um, begin to stagnate and that basically has carried on ever since then, which meant people couldn't afford to buy homes. Um, and then towards the end of the 80s, Thatcher scraps rent controls 
and introduces right to buy. Um, so on the one hand, making private rented housing totally unaffordable and decimating social housing. And, and it's worth noting on right to buy that although the Scottish government has uh, scrapped right to buy, it no longer exists in Scotland, Scotland was way worse hit by it. Because of the demographics and because there was more social housing, proportionally, Scotland was hit much worse by right to buy. And even though it has been scrapped, um, social housing continues to be demolished and not replaced. Um, and right to buy, obviously, the theory was that the, the, the narrative was, you know, working class people could buy their home and have security. And, and that was a popular prospect uh, amongst many people at the time. But the reality is that a huge number of former right to buy properties just ended up in the hands of private landlords. So in some places, as many as 50% of the ex-council homes that were sold off through right to buy are now owned by private landlords. Charles Gow, who is the son of Thatcher's housing minister who did this, he personally owns more than 30 um, ex-council uh, ex, um, flats. And then it's just got worse since then. So in the 90s, the buy-to-let buy mortgages, where people who already owned a home were encouraged to buy a home, a second home to rent out, that exploded. Um, and ever since the financial crash in 2008, issues around wage stagnation have only got worse. And so that's, that's why housing looks the way it does. Um, and so the Scottish government, you know, we're not partisan in any way, but they have just failed to recognize the scale of the problem. So um, in 2016, they introduce something called rent pressure zones. Now, in theory, what a rent pressure zone does is, and there's a, a big, uh, um, that, that in theory is doing a lot of the lift here. It allows a local authority to designate a specific area as a rent pressure zone for up to five years. And then in that rent pressure zone, rent PRS rents wouldn't be allowed to go up within the tenancy by any more than CPI plus 1% plus something else. That's the theory. The reality is they have been an utter failure, even on the Scottish government's own terms. Um, so what's wrong with them? So the, the first problem, the most obvious one, is that they're impossible to implement. So they've been on the statute books for five years and no council has been able to do one. Um, despite Edinburgh, Glasgow and Highlands, and I think maybe one other, have all commissioned kind of feasibility studies into it and they've all been told it's not possible. And, and the reason for that is in order for a council to successfully make an application to have an area designated as a rent pressure zone, they need to provide a level of detail and data and evidence that simply doesn't exist and that councils basically can't collect. Uh, and the Scottish government have told councils, they told Edinburgh Council, that they, they wouldn't help them do that. But So rent pressure zones don't work anyway, um, but it is our view that even if you could implement them, they wouldn't work, uh, they wouldn't help tenants. So there's, there's four main reasons for it. The first is that they, they only limit increases, but rents are already too high. It's our view that rents have to begin by coming down. Only then can you start to, to limit them. And the and, and the limits on increases they, they, they do have are too high anyway. You, you can't have a rent pressure zone cap that's below inflation. Um, so what that would mean is above in, legislate for above inflation increases, even in a rent pressure zone, which is crazy. Um, they don't touch quality, so they're only about cost. But as, as, we, as, as we saw before, quality is a massive issue in, in Scotland's rented housing. And we think rent controls are a really powerful tool to force that quality up. We'll talk about how that works in a moment. Um, and then just lastly, they uh, they can't even be a whole local authority. So the idea is that it would be a couple streets, which I think is, um, misses the point of what's going on. And then lastly, and this, this one is in some ways the most technical, potentially, but in my view, one of the most important. Now, they, rent pressure zones and lots of the other proposals you hear from rent controls would only limit increases within a tenancy right so what that means is if you move into a flat in a rent pressure zone or one of these other models then your landlord could only increase rent by a certain amount maybe inflation or whatever it is um year on year while you're there but the moment you leave and someone else comes in they can increase it by whatever they want but the reason that's a problem is first of all it doesn't limit increases in the long term it just makes them more staggered and um, it also creates a financial incentive for your landlord to try and evict you uh, and a, a financial disincentive for you to move if your circumstances change. Now, that could be uh, you, you get a job in another place and, it's, and you, you have to commute because you can afford to, to risk leaving and, and going to higher um, rent or a relationship breakdown and things like that. Um, but potentially the most crucial is, is this. Now, this is from some evidence from Germany where you see the, the dotted line. Is the that, that's what like free market rents would be. The idea is they would just go up in this kind of steady fashion. And then this blue line is if you only limit rents at the start of um, uh, uh, during tenancies, but not in between them, 
you get this more staggered effect. Now that over in the long term, the effect is maybe the same, right? That um, 10 years time rents would be what they, what the other wise would be. But what you find is that landlords increase rent artificially in between tenancies to compensate for not being able to increase them as much as they want within them. Now, what that means is if you're in the tenancy for the full three, four, five years of the, of the period, maybe it balances out, maybe you benefit a little bit. But if you're only there for the first six months, the first year, you end up paying more because of that, that compensation the landlords do. And, and so what you see is the most vulnerable tenants, the tenants who most need these protections, um, you know, they're in precarious work, they're having to move a lot, they're in uh, kind of difficult domestic situations, they could end up made worse off by this. So, so that's why rent pressure zones don't work at all. Um, so I'll talk quickly about what our proposal is uh, and I'll share in the chat, um, or Emma, if you could do it, our policy paper that goes into a lot more detail about this. Um, but basically we, we've identified five things that rent controls have to do. Um, the first is that they have to bring rents down, not just limit increases. Uh, the second is that the goal has to be affordability, not predictability. That's an important one because the government talks a lot of the language of predictability. But if you can predict that you're going to be made homeless in six months' time, it doesn't help. We need affordability, not just not just kind of secure, not um, not predictability or certainty or whatever. Um, third is that they have to apply all across Scotland. The, these issues affect everyone in the whole country. It's not just a matter of like. Edinburgh city centre and, and like maybe parts of Glasgow, the, these issues are everywhere. Um, they have to be linked to the property, not the tenancy, so that it doesn't matter if you move and someone else moves in um, for, the, for the reasons I just spoke about. And the fifth one is that they need to be linked to the quality of the property, not just the cost. Um, so they have to be used as both a carrot and a stick to force landlords to improve the quality of homes. Um, so how does it work? Um, our model, now, now it's interesting that rent controls are spoken about in hushed terms a bit as if they're these like fringe far left idea, but the reality is that almost everywhere in Europe has had rent controls in one form or another for over 100 years. And that means there is literally a century of peer reviewed research and evidence and data about how they work, what negative consequences and side effects there might be and how you mitigate against them. And we spent a long time pulling the different, the best bits from different models to, to create something that we think works for Scotland. And, and so I'll share the, the policy paper and, and, and we've got a briefing on it as well that, that I would encourage people to take a moment to look at, but there's basically four pillars to it. So the first is that we want um, rent set, not according to market rates, but like a points-based system. Which if you, um, basically the idea is if you're gonna have like a jacuzzi in your flat, it's gonna be really expensive, but if, um, uh, but if you just have like a roof over your head, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't break the bank. And that this um, points-based system is linked to quality. So that if, for example, currently, if your window doesn't shut, there's basically nothing you can do to force your landlord to, to deal with it. And um, if they could only charge you 50 quid a month, you only had to pay 50 quid a month, you can be damn sure they would fix your window quickly. So that's how the points-based system works. Um, as I say, it would be attached to the property, not the lease. So you could come and go as often as you want and other people can move in wouldn't affect them and I'll jump to this one the, the Scottish Living Rent Commission we've proposed like a, a central body that would have responsibility for like collecting evidence and data and, and stuff on this because there, there really is like a lack of, of good um, reliable information around this um, but then this this rent affordability index is really crucial for us because lots of the proposals you're, you'll see rent pressure zones do it but other other even even kind of better better intentioned ones also do it they propose linking rent increases to some other existing measure. The most common one is inflation, um, but you'll sometimes see uh, average wages and things like that. And, and what we have always said is both inflation and average wages don't reflect the fact that, first of all, no one's wages are going up by inflation uh, and, and certainly haven't historically over the last you know, 30, 40 years. But even if you were to look at average wages, um, if you take, for example, Edinburgh City Centre, right, the average wages are going to be really high because they're massively inflated by wealthy people who don't live in the private rented sector. And tenants who are younger, who are more likely to be migrants, who are more likely to be in work that what pays less, the average wage of a tenant is way less than the average wage in, in an area uh, as a whole. Um, and so that's why we've proposed not just pegging something, pegging increases to some pre-existing model, but starting a specific index designed to ensure affordability for tenants. Um, now, just 
just really briefly, because I, I know we don't have a, a ton of time, but there are a lot of myths you'll hear about rent controls. And I want to touch on them. I'll, I'll speed through them. Um, so the first question is, isn't the problem supply, right? You'll hear that all the problems in, in private rented housing are, are a simple question of supply and demand, basic economics 101. And the answer is no, that is not the case at all. Um, in the private rented sector, there's a higher proportion of empty bedrooms in the UK than at any time since the Great Plague, right? 700 odd years. Uh, the ratio of rooms to people in, in the UK has never been higher in history, never. Um, and, and more importantly, there really isn't very much evidence at all that rent controls are bad for supply um, or that our current model is good for it. So less than one in 10 of the new homes created in the private rented sector have been new built. The vast majority, 90%, have been former council homes that have been siphoned off out of something more secure into the private rented sector or homes that previously were owned by families and, and lived in and, and never being rented out to, to tenants. And, and the, you know, you'll hear people talk about, oh, there's too much red tape around, around development. That's the problem. Pe people can't build it, even if they want to. But the truth is that we have one of the worst planning systems in, in Europe, which means that right at any given point, there's up to 400,000 homes with planning permission that's been granted that aren't being built because developers make more money sitting on the land, what's called land banking, than they do building homes on it. So, so where does this myth come from? Now, I, I, it is true that we need more social housing, and, and that's really important. That doesn't necessarily all need to be new built, but a big part of that could be taking what's currently private rented homes back into the, the social sector. But, but this myth that we just need to build new homes comes from landlords and developers who know that if we just build new homes, and we just build new private rented homes and, and often luxury high-end private rented homes without tackling any of the issues of control, taxation, ownership, uh, any of that stuff, then it just means more assets for them to make profit, profit off. And that's why developers will always say, no, we just need to build. Uh, and it's really important that, yes, we need to build, but we need to build social housing. The last thing we need is more private rented housing, certainly not um, if it's going to be built with public money. I'll power through the, the other demands. So again, you'll hear all landlords would leave the sector and tenants wouldn't have nowhere to live. Um, if you know if we bring in rent controls, cut their profit, they'll, they'll have to leave. Uh, first of all, there is absolutely no evidence that this is the case. Um, and it doesn't even, you know, if you spend just a couple minutes thinking about it, if you're a landlord making £1,200 a month and suddenly you can only make £1,000 a month, are you just going to shut up shop and make nothing? It's, it's nonsense. But, but more importantly, right, Good fucking riddance. We don't need private re private rented sector, the, the size it is, right? And, and there's this classic tool of blackmail where landlords, you, you saw it with bankers during the financial crisis. They said, if you tax our bonuses, we'll all leave. And there was this website someone made called, we'll drive you to the fucking airport.com. And it was like, we don't want you to blackmail us. And, and, uh, and that's not, you know, that's not how we should do politics. But, but the, the really fundamental point here is, the private rented sector hasn't been this big, as big as it has for, for, for half a century. And it's the worst form of tenure. And so any interventions we can make that shrink the private, the size of the private rented sector, either um, forcing landlords to sell properties to uh, families who'd rather buy, um, or we, we work out models that councils can take those, those, those homes back into, into public ownership and social housing, that would be a good thing. And we shouldn't shy away from that. Um, so those horror stories are they're 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 nothing of the sort. Um, you'll also hear this. You'll hear that you know, we had rent controls and it was a disaster. And this was David Cameron used to say this a lot. He says, "I don't support." The, he said this in Parliament. I don't support the idea of mass rent controls because I think we would see a massive decline in the private rented sector, which is what happened the last time we had such rent controls. Now that is true. Between 1915 and, and the end of the 80s, well, so in 1915, roughly 90% uh, of people in the UK lived in private rented homes. They looked very different to what they do now, but they, they, that was how it worked. By the, when rent controls were scrapped, it was roughly one in 10. So you saw this massive, massive decline. But that was, by absolutely any measure, a massive success of public policy. I, I think on a par with building the NHS. Um, and, and it happened not by accident because we were strangling supply or whatever. It happened because of the deliberate policy objectives of successive both Labour and Tory governments. We built millions of council homes 
we demolished millions of slums that were owned by private landlords uh, making, a, making, a, making a killing. And we saw real terms wage increases uh, and the advent of mortgages that allowed people to, to buy their own homes. So the collapse of the private rented sector was a good thing. And the growth of it since has been an absolute unparalleled disaster for not just for tenants, but for the, the, the UK and, and Scottish economy more generally. Um, and then just lastly, this is just a, I'll, 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 I'll skip this one then. Sorry. Um, so uh, our campaign, um, so there's, uh, what's, what's going on? So just at the election, um, the Scottish government have pledged uh, a new housing bill. And as Emma says, they have promised to start a new rented housing strategy in the first hundred days of, of Parliament. We're already 20 odd days through, so that'll be coming soon. We've got loads of MSP meetings lined up. And so it's really important that we're, we're, we're hammering home that narrative and we're, we're forcing politicians to, to take this on. Um, Green and SNP ones in particular, but that we're holding, get, making sure that opposition MSPs are holding them their feet to the fire. But where we are gonna win this is not in lobbying nicely behind closed doors with MSPs. It's by building power in our communities and building living rent into a fighting organization that can force politicians to act in our interests. Uh, and so the lay of the land is that Greens and Labour have, um, you know, as a big success of our, our election campaign, they have pledged to support rent controls to greater or lesser extent. Uh, and the SNP, well, they've not promised much detail. They have promised this new bill, which we're now in the beginning stages of. And, and I think this is important, they've admitted that rent pressure zones were a failure. But interestingly, internally to the SNP, there is huge support for rent control. So in fact, in 2016, their, uh, their, their conference passed unanimously a motion tabled by a living rent uh, member supporting rent control. So we know internally there, there's huge support for it. But I'll just finish on this. Um, there are two ways we can bring rents down, right? One is by the government introducing rent controls and, and bringing in, you know, taking the, the, the scale of the problem seriously and, 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 and addressing it. Uh, the second is the way we won rent controls in 1950, by building power and by forcing them. And so Living Rent is not a lobbying organization. We're a fighting movement in our communities. And if the government won't listen and won't do what it takes to save save tenants and, and, and tackle the, the powerful vested interests in the private rented sector, then we'll fucking do their job for them. Woohoo! Grand. Um, 